Oh, hello. Um, ma alustan eesti keeles, et me oleme Lauraga Eestist. Um, and then we have a friend here, Tadeusz from uh, Czech. And we all met in TU Delft in the Netherlands, and now we're uh, kind of touring the world a little bit. And uh, find a, we found a nice occasion to uh, propose something for the uh, Estonian pavilion for uh, the coming year. So uh, let's go. Uh, we're titled uh, Weak Monument. Um, Weak monument, monument observes the roles of the monument, its antithesis and the in between. The, the monument of the third international designed by uh, Vladimir Tatlin from 1920 has long been established has long established a position within the architectural discourse. Less known is its counterform, its architectural uh, inversion, a shed-like monument uh, to the anti-international design by Leonhard Lapin uh, some 50, 50 years later. So we propose to revive this ridicular, uh, ridicule of architect as an all-powerful, all-heroic figure and through it explore the very possibility of uh, the possibility of a monument. And uh, today we thought the best way to actually show it is we present an architectural project with all its components, a drawing, a model, a site, the text, and eventually this will form our uh, project. So, a shed and a pyramid. Let's use these two to uh, draw a spectrum with the two as opposite extremes. The pyramid represents the power of idea to shape matter, man's ability to organize the chaos of nature by means of abstraction. And then the shed, within the shed, we enjoy the exact opposite qualities. We enjoy the complexity of it, the softness, the disorder, silhouette, the organic layering of materials. Uh, compared to the pyramid, the shed embodies a series of incidental decisions that can result in countless for, uh, forms. Compared to pyramid, shed is robust. It allows for alterations and appropriations and life. Um, it is universally recognizable symbol of the pyramid. Is a, the pyramid is a, a universally recognizable symbol of power. Um, it can only be built by a collective force and transformed by a collective force um, into a, uh, in such quantities and in such geometric power, whereas the shed can even be built by one single person. One of the best known pyramids of all time is Vladimir Tatlin's Monument to the Third International that was designed by him in 1920. It has only ever lived in drawings, it was never built. It has only been alive as a geometric figure. It's pure and unstained as such by compromises of politics, economics, or reason. Um, it has as such maintained a canonical position within the architectural discourse. It became a monument despite being modern one to replace all other memorials of the, by that time, dead Tsarist Russia. Tatlin's revolving pyramid saw the world, or rather forced one to see the world, through the lens of a single overarching idea, the communist revolution. We propose to create Tatlin's 400 meter high structure in an interpretive one to 200 line drawing. And this will initiate the discussion on the monument. And then there's a model that will face the drawing. Six meters tall, made of timber, slats, and stone, a door and a window and bells. Leonard Lapin's monument to the anti-international designed in 1979 is a less known counter form of Tatlin's pyramid. It's its shed and its architectural inversion. Um, it is clearly a political statement bound to its geographic and temporal context, but it is also an architectural intervention which questions the concepts of form, of monument, and even the architectural project as such. Uh, instead of accommodating a revolving committee producing one revolution per year, the anti-monument was to house 
the creator's friends, artist Valdo Rojaka's Donkey. Long live donkeys, inspirators for modern destructive architecture, is a slogan written on the stable's elevation Y. It is precisely within the annotations uh, that the open nature of this monument re re reveals itself in its full form. Uh, the architect has written on the drawings little annotations saying things like, window could be of different sizes, size completely arbitrary. Uh, it's saying interiors will be arranged by the donkey. What we see here is a threefold mockery of the path as present in Tutlin's original design. It's a, a, a ridicule of its abstract form, its utopian program, and its prescriptive, prescriptive nature. What we propose is building a one-to-one -one model of the donkey stable based on its original drawings. One back. <laughs> every, uh, every opportunity that is shown on the drawings to further disrupt the already disordered form we would take, so we would follow the annotations that allow the form to be changed. Um, we propose the use of standard off-shelf products, such as doors and windows, as well as reclaimed materials, local to both geographical context, Estonian and Venetian. Tutlin's high-rise monument represents the architect as a heroic figure of power imposing his ideas over existing cities, societies, and histories whereas the architect of the donkey stable decides to give away his power and become powerless. So what we see here is a deliberate position of weakness in Lapin's project. Um, this is something that can be read in a wider cultural uh, and geographical context. Um, it's can be traced to Arte Povera in Italy, to work of Robert Smithson in America at the time. Um, and we are definitely not the first ones to speak of weakness. Uh, the idea of weak thought was invented by Italian philosopher Gianni Vattimo, who proposed the, the device of weak thought as something that can help us to operate within the dissolved uh, contemporary condition, um, which in a way was addressed by the speaker before us as well. Uh, so the weak thought is uh, a device that is manifold, never universal, and exploits the condition rather than fights against it. The first architect to pick up this idea of weakness was Ignacio de Sola Morales in his essay, uh, Weak Architecture, from 1989 in which he really tries to apply this philosophic idea into architecture theory. And he's also the first one who comes up with this idea of weak monument, uh, an oxymoron, but to us uh, an observation that is maybe more valid for our present condition to, than to his own uh, when the essay was written in 1989. So just to simply explain what a weakness in an architectural project can be. Um, let's think of an example that everybody knows in a way, the Regent Street in London, uh, which actually was supposed to be a straight boulevard uh, as the Parisian boulevards. John Nash intended it as one of these monumental axes, uh, as a monumental axis of London, but that never happened, as you can see, because uh, the English are too insistent on private ownership and because of all the accidents and all the obstacles the architect had to face, the, what we got is this curvy, uh, disordered boulevard which now is one of the iconic places of London. As an example of weakness on an urban scale, of course what we are doing, we are employing weakness on the scale of a model uh, of Lapin's Don Quixote. This is the first claim so far intervention. Um, here we can see how we do follow those opportunities of weakness in the annotations of Lapin's original drawings. And um, here you also see the first claims of our site, the next chapter of our project. Um, so, what, so far we have established this opposition of a drawing and a model of 
a monument and anti-monument uh, of Tatlin and Lapin. Uh, and we've explained what's the formal difference. Uh, how, but how is it exactly that they are monuments? Uh, to elaborate on this idea, we're illustrated with uh, the famous manifesto of monumentality by Siegfried Gideon from 1943 that speaks of modern monument. Uh, modern monument, in other words, that's what we see in Tatlin's example. But uh, the, what you saw already on the picture of the model is another kind of monumel, monument, a sacral, sacral monument, one that employs uh, the idea of type and of a language. Monument, from our point of view, is an architectural device which employs memory. It's an explicit expression of power over histories. Uh, so memory is the key concept here. And here we see the three ways a memory can be used in a, of, to, to create a monument. So we have the church. We propose the Church of Santa Maria uh, on the Via Garibaldi, uh, which is... Uh, one back, please. Um, uh, so we have three monuments, uh, the, the modern, the, the classical one, and, and the weak one. Via Garibaldi, Venice. <laughs> uh, so what we weak, weak thought is never prescriptive. Uh, we already exploded the original duality of uh, Tatlin and Lapin uh, by the third element, the church, the site, the, the classical monument. This allows for further expansion. This allows us to find and really exploit the in-between space. Um, and so we have these two extremes. We have the pyramid and the shed. And in between, we're looking for these opportunities of weakness um, in all different geographical and historical contexts. So we propose a curatorial research project um, organized around peer reviews and presented in a catalog, a big catalog of A2 format um, that will sit within the drawing, the model and the site. So this, what you can see here is one of the examples that we regard as uh, being of interest in the research for weak monuments. Can we think of a temporary monument? This is a scaffolding in Domgerik in Tallinn, and it was built for the purpose of the restoration of the altar, but it also allows for public access, alternative views on the church, it, as well as uh, alternative views on the altar itself. This is another example. Can a monument be spontaneous or does it need to be planned? So, uh, this is a uh, so-called goddess of democracy, which was built in three days by the art students during the Tiananmen protests in Beijing in 1989. Um, can we think of a monument that's actually absent? So that the absence creates the monument? This is by uh, Horst uh, Ho Ho Heisel, uh proposing actually to remo the removal of uh, the Brandenburg gates in Berlin. Uh, this is also a question of uh, uh, can a normal arbitrary uh, office building become a monument and this is an abandoned uh, building uh, in Lebanon during, uh, that because of the civil war was abandoned and stays there because it's too big to be taken down. Or what is actually the nature of an architectural project as such? This is a monumental gate which was uh, built during uh, the coronation of Maximilian II in the 16th century, um, except it never was. This was a painting commissioned by Al to Albrecht Dürer, which was uh, depicting a fictional monument. Uh, and it really gives us a, an opportunity to uh, explore what is the nature of an architectural project as such when it's not even intended to be built and never will be. So uh, to wrap it up, um, this is a uh uh, how we see actually this um, pavilion coming together. We have uh, the drawing, the model, the site, and the text. In the middle you see our, uh, the text as a research uh, cur curatorial um, part of the work. Um, so the structure of this exhibition resembles an architectural project, and I think it's uh, for a reason, because uh, uh, um, the contemporary, like, uh, 
the position of the contemporary architect is uh, very much constrained and we see it because of laws and policies. And that's why uh, I think um, this kind of a research allows uh, uh, another alternative view to it. And in a way it kind of fits with the free space idea of this, uh, this year as they look for uh, platforms that could discuss uh, ways that are not allowed normally in the architectural uh, scene. Um, so Monument is an expansion of uh, power, over, uh, is an expression of power over history. And the anti-monument is different. It's informal and it's omnipresent in form and um, in time. Uh, so through combining the, the weakness and monumentality, we can question the power of architect and the project. So uh, our proposal is a project. Um, this has been also a collaborative team that we worked until now for uh, questions and uh, for reviewers that we intend to work with uh, for the text, for the catalog. And this is our final image. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> questions from Shuri first. Yeah, Veronica, please. Picking up on something you mentioned about uh, absence that uh, creates a monument, um, could your proposal work uh, without building the pavilion in, in Venice? Just to, to, to consider that what you said also about a monument being an architectural device that exploits memory and um, referring to several monuments uh, in, in Venice already um, and speaking of oxymorons um, to build what you propose I think in my view would be an oxymoron in itself. Um, if I can answer um so we have deliberate, deliberately went for a structure of a traditional project. And in each of the chapters, we are aware of, if we're questioning a project, why do we have a project? And we have it in order to make, to, to bring up this question. Each of the chapters, the drawing, the model, the text, uh, each of them is done in an open way. So for instance, the the drawing, we already started, inquired, we, we would produce the drawing in a, non, in, in a way that does not have an altar, or the catalog, the text that we propose uh, would be done in such a way that is non-narrative uh, by the type of binding. These kind of seeming details and or aspects of these different parts of the projects, we think that they allow us to really question each of these elements and overly to kind of come closer to questioning the authority of the architect over his design. If that answers your question. You somehow widened the definition of monument. Um, what is the difference between monument and ordinary building? You showed one example is empty buildings and, and a mon monument, but how do you then, if you w widen this m definition so so much, and w where do you draw the line between the monument and the chest building, or there is no line between? Yeah, there, I think this is what the pavilion offers. This is sort of a revision of what do we consider nowadays as a monument, because a monument, in a way, as a kind of, a, let's say, in the old school way, how we think of it is uh, something uh, vertical in the middle of square. And of course, we can now say that maybe it's an outdated version. It's a sort of a very uh, central kind of vision way of, visionary way, like central absolutist way of seeing what a monument is. But of course, now with this pavilion, we want to really understand uh, and recollect these ideas, what the monument could be. And of course, this tower is just a random office block but because it has become empty, it has become somehow important for the people who live there. Uh, so the meaning of the monument has greatly altered ever since uh, modernism, of course, and this is what we are trying to uh, uh, research. And then all of them, so the, this precise uh, example of the tower, um, there's a certain moment of memory or recollection embedded in that example too, because that tower was used by the snipers during the war. So then, and it was known as such, and now as an architectural object that's not 
taken down, it stands there as a memory of a war, more so than any kind of built object would do, probably. Or okay. But can I ask then, uh, why do you think the monument is important and relevant today? Why it's important to, to look back and today, you actually today, not 10 years ago or after five years? Or I can give it a try. Of course, I mean, this is, this, this is the idea of it. Of course, it's a discussion, and we all have also different views, and that's kind of beautiful about the process. But I think, uh, in a way, like monuments are sort of uh, tipping points and sort of cultural events. So you have a lot of people who put effort into kind of a totem for their culture in their time. Um, but somehow I think uh, nowadays we're losing these sort of tipping points because everything is becoming very fluid. So the tipping points have kind of flattened out into a sort of or, you know event horizon. So there's no idea of uh, uh, like how do you, how do now nowadays people present themselves? Like what are the cultural artifacts and the monuments and the totems? Uh, and I think it's a really a very relevant question. You know we have a lot of subgroups and different people who can uh, accustom quickly according to their interests. So how do you how do you manage this? I mean, the last I think if we take a look at the the about the summit, the Freedom Cross in, in Tallinn, then of course it raised very important questions because there were a lot of against it, but it was still being built. So w what kind of a monument uh, nowadays speaks with you know the people and who are then the people? Let's say, I would say it's a very uh, it's a more relevant question than ever. Okay, thank you. So more question from jury. No more question from jury. Please, please welcome to, please ask. Yeah. There, there is one question. Uh, sorry, I might missed it, but uh, uh, will there be a donkey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An, a model of a donkey, yes. No, uh, no, but no real one. The real donkey. Yeah. We're, wo we're working so hard on it. Yeah. <laughs> also, it is a model of the stable, which... Uh, it's kind of a relevant point here. Um. And we also thought of bringing the donkey to the opening. <laughs> Is there any connection between Estonia and donkey? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yeah, sure. Any other questions from the crowd? Just a quick question about uh, location. Uh, it was different before, now you changed it. Do you also have kind of a, a certain kind of scouting agreement with the people from the church that it's a feasible place to have it? We've been talking to a Venetian uh, exhibition design agency and, they're, and we're talking to them uh, regarding only then the renting of, the, of, the, of a venue that would suit us. So we've... Uh, we've found a list of uh, six or seven spaces that could fit us architecturally, and they're of different uh, budgets, and of course none of them, I mean, they're all available as of now. It's all a question of uh, when they would be um, confirmed. We had a hidden slide, and we, don't, we cannot show it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there any more questions? If there is no more questions, then we, we are thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.